We do have some animal model studies where they were able to give out of season fruit to both rats and both monkeys and they found that they gained more visceral and uh, the different uh, lipogenic, like fat forming enzymes, were upregulated compared to when they ate that fruit in season. But a lot of people live and die by these kind of templated formulas and they have the same amount of nutrients every single day. And we know from adaptive thermogenesis, we know from controlled feeding studies, the body adapts to what you do, right? If you lift weights where you walk the same pace and the same distance and time every day, your body quickly adapts. So, you know, have, oscillating your calories is good to keep your, your metabolism from just adapting and then possibly slowing down. Body, mind, empowerment. Get stronger, faster, smarter, quicker, friendlier, more helpful, more driven. Everything the body needs. Control your mind. Welcome to the Body Mind Empowerment Podcast. I'm your host Seamland and our guest today is Mike Mutzel. Mike is the host of High Intensity Health Podcast and YouTube channel. He's also a MS in clinical nutrition, an author, speaker, and a functional medicine consultant. Mike, welcome to the show. Sim, thanks so much for having me on. It's great to be here. Yeah, we actually met like a few weeks ago and uh, in the Metabolic Health Summit in LA. So what have you been up to like over the past uh, month or so? Yeah, great question. Um, what have I been up to? Well, we processed our first turkey in the backyard. So we, uh, it's Thanksgiving is big around here in the US and my brother-in-law didn't want to have uh, our turkey. He had some other ideas. So we let these turkeys get bigger and bigger. And uh, we had backyard chickens and two pigs and stuff like that. And the turkeys just started because spring is coming here in Seattle. They started fighting like crazy. So we have two male turkeys and one female. And the two males were going nuts over the female. It was weird. So we had to process the turkey, mm. one of the males. And so that was interesting. Like the last weeks, so we've been eating a lot more meat than normal because I mean, he was massive. He was like, right. not massive, but you know, he, got, he lived a lot longer than he probably would have uh, if he was in another farm. So that was interesting, just like going through that. So I'm working on a video to like share with people kind of that journey. And um, mm. it's really kind of change my perspective uh, around meat consumption, you know, because it, it takes a lot of resources to grow animals and it's a lot of time. And then, you know, once you kill them, they go through rigor mortis and you need to let that, you know, you need to brine them and let that. So it was just really, the whole process just had me think so much differently about food, which was kind of fun. So that's been unique. And, you know, like you, I do a lot of research, you know, here at home and Nice. like to like help people interpret studies and and uh help them find kind of salient points from research that uh you know because some people they don't know how to go into pubmed or find that you know how you can look at a study then look at the referencing studies and then pick it's like this whole rabbit hole in this network of like trying to figure out you know how we can manipulate our biology in a positive way to influence our health so that's what i've been up to yeah, that's for sure. Like, uh, there's definitely a lot of, um, you know, most people, the only nutrition advice they get comes from the social media channels like YouTube, podcasts, Instagram, and so on. So they never actually, you know, go into the real studies. So we, right. we as influencers, so to say, have quite a lot of responsibility in terms of uh, giving people the actual, uh, like, uh, advice and uh, making sure that it's quality and it's actually, like, true to a certain extent, or at least it's what the science says. Totally. That's such a good point, you know, and uh, like we all have our biases. I know you love autophagy and we both share a mutual interest in keto. And so I, I try to, although I am very biased, I try to like remove that as much as possible and not get too overexcited or too, to oversell something, right. uh, a concept or a belief or an ideology and try to step back. And I, I really do like to listen to like the calories in calories out folks to see what they're saying and to like say, okay, am I right or am I wrong here? I think it's good to like hear both sides of the story and that challenges our own beliefs and causes us to dig deeper and learn new information so I, I encourage all people listening or watching this um, because we get into these bias bubbles and we only seek out information that reinforces what we already want to hear and know more about so it's really great to listen to people that have opposing viewpoints um, obviously if they're rational and sane and if they're if they are too drawing upon science so yeah it's, a, it's an interesting way to just continue to learn and evolve yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And I'm, I myself as well, like, although I am, I am listening to a lot of the top influencers and the top people who are in the low carb space and so on, but I'm also listening to other, other people who are doing the opposite, like a high carb approach or something. So I don't want to enclose myself or, or become uh, close minded because of following a certain uh, dietary strategy. I just want to make sure that it's, I hear all the voices and opinions, and then I will make my own uh, research and uh, my own conclusions. Totally. It's oh. such a good point. 
yeah how would you like define your nutrition then uh, what kind of a band what kind of a band camp would you want to put yourself in yeah that's a great question sim well you know it really depends on my exercise program that i'm doing so right now i'm training for a powerlifting competition my second one i'm just kind of getting into this uh, i've been lifting weights for a long time since i was 14 years old i used to be this skinny little kid and older siblings would beat up on me and throw me downstairs and all that. So I wanted to like put on more muscle to like combat that. Right. Uh, but I recently got into powerlifting. So I'm having, I just started training for this upcoming event in May. So I started having more carbohydrates. So mm -hmm. I still do a lot of fasting and everything like that, but I don't fast for longer than 24 hours just right now. Cause I found just with me and some other people are so different. You know, I, mm -hmm. I'm kind of like a hard gainer, kind of a skinnier body type. There's some people that look at weights and they put on muscle. Right. And so for, if you're that type of person, maybe you can do 36 hour or 48 hour fast every week and still put on muscle. But me, I lose strength and everything. So specifically right now, I would consider it more carb cycling is what I'm into. So it's pretty low carb most days, but on days where I'm doing heavier, you know, whether it's yard work, cutting down trees, doing things like that, whatever, I'll have more carbs on those days. But on days where I'm relatively uh, not inactive per se, but not really lifting a lot of weights and so on, just having recreational activity. That's where I'm very kind of strict keto under like 15, 20 grams of carbs during that day. So I like to have that flexibility. And I think that's an important point for people. You know, um, certain gurus, they eat one way only, right? I, I have less than 20 grams of carbs or I'm zero carb. Okay, that's great, but you're not that person. So I think it's really good to customize things. And there's days where, Sim, and I'm sure you've had this too, where you're really active and you have maybe more carbs, like 80 grams of carbs. Mm -hmm. Guess what? If you test your ketone levels, you're still in ketosis. Mm -hmm. At least if you're physically active, I found that for myself. So mm -hmm. I like to custom tailor thing, custom tailor things, and 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 that's just my approach. And but keep in mind that I haven't been obese before. Like in college, I was a little overweight because I was eating like crap and partying, right? But outside of that, like I've been pretty fit for a long time. I don't have diabetes or disease. So if people are listening to this and they've been overweight for their whole life or they have diabetes or they have autoimmunity, they probably should be pretty strict for a while until they get that under control. But once you kind of get to a certain baseline level of health, I think you have a lot more flexibility. And I think that's the cool part about this because as we get into spring and summer, we have things like blueberry polyphenols, raspberries. There's a lot of great compounds. And you talk about them in your wonderful book uh, about how these polyphenols enhance autophagy and they have health benefits. So if we have this very strict mindset that I only eat zero carbs, right? You're like, well, you miss out on what, a, what nature is providing for us. And some people have such bad gut health from antibiotics and lack of breastfeeding and C-section delivery that they just can't even tolerate those polyphenols and I get it zero carb might work for them But I like to work people towards this flexible approach right. because I think it's you know the only Diet that has stood the test of time is eating seasonally mm. and there's a time and a place for for meat and eggs and all butter and ghee and all that and I think there's a time and a place for berries and root vegetables and tubers and I don't think if you're a hungry hunter gatherer you would ignore the berries because they have carbs right you would just eat them and so that's just my approach and people have given me crap about it but that's just what I try to do and and here's my bias again I have a lot of blueberries in our backyard I've planted raspberries so so that's my bias I'm just throwing it out there so that's my approach yeah I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the metabolic flexibility as well and you know although I wish I could eat keto for the rest of my life all the time because it's so easy and uh, so kind of simple to stick to but I still know that I will benefit from changing it up every once in a while and incorporating that flexibility and you know cycling between different food groups just for the sake of you yeah, not developing any intolerance to them and also I like cycling between these different training regimes as well so it's a definitely a good idea to always know that the only constant is change so to say that you shouldn't expect to stay for the same diet and eat the same foods for the rest of life all the time because yeah like you said the seasonality those things will definitely change and your own body compositions change as well your uh, metabolic requirements everything change so yeah that's the only constant that you can kind of rely on that that uh, <laughs> things will change and you better like be able to adapt to it uh, much faster Sam couldn't have said it any better. So eloquently said. And I think a lot of people, what they do is they get these macro calculators and there's nothing wrong with that initially. Like you're learning your body, how many calories do I need and all that sort of stuff. But a lot of people live and die by these 
kind of templated formulas and they have the same amount of nutrients every single day. And we know from adaptive thermogenesis, we know from controlled feeding studies, the body adapts to what you do, right? If you lift weights where you walk the same pace and the same distance and time every day, your body quickly adapts. So I think by oscillating your calories even, forget carbohydrates for a moment and fat, just your total caloric volume. And, you know, in bodybuilding and fitness, we call this a cheat day, having a cheat day where you have a lot more surplus of calories. And I think that, and, and I don't have, I wish, and I don't know of any studies at this point that is the controlled for this and, and thrown this in there because I think it would be hard to actually isolate out from other confounding variables. But I do believe, and, and people have shown this over time, you know, have oscillating your calories is good to keep your, your metabolism from just adapting and then possibly mm-hmm. slowing down. So I know it's hard for folks listening because, you know, and I found this mostly, and this isn't a knock on women, but I found women are very regimented. They like to have a, a plan, a protocol, a system. And so they like to follow their macros to a T. But I like to encourage my clients over time to just kind of get rid of that and just have a little bit more flexibility built into the program and understand that on certain days, if you have, you know, that change, it's overall going to be good for you in the long run. Mm, yeah definitely like so what would you say are the best times to eat like a more keto template and sometimes to eat uh, more more carbs yeah this is beautiful a beautiful question i think it's kind of right now right as we get out of winter into spring the ground is still cold there's not a lot of you know vegetables and fruits growing so i think it's a great time to do a little bit more fasting a little bit more keto uh definitely during the winter too because if you're a hunter gatherer like you're not having blueberries you know because so as much as we lo- both love polyphenols i pick on the people that january 1st they have their acai bowl berry smoothie with kale and it's like all that stuff is being flown in from South America. Like how healthy really is that for us uh, during that time of the year? So I think there's a time and a place for that. Um, Again, like we give our daughter, she's six years old. If she wants a blueberry smoothie, we're not like you can't eat out of season fruits. You know, we're not like that hardcore, but we just don't make it a staple uh, in in our personal diet. So um, I think, you know, to answer your question specifically, late fall, winter, early spring, great time for keto. Uh, More carb cycling as things start blooming and are coming into season. Uh, I wish I had randomized placebo controlled studies to draw on for this, but Hmm. We do have some animal model studies where, and I don't know exactly the methodology that they use, but they were able to give out of season fruit to both rats and both monkeys. And they found that they gained more visceral and uh, the different uh, lipogenic, like fat forming enzymes were upregulated compared to when they ate that fruit in season. So Hmm. I think there is some element and I don't know what it is. Is it circadian clocks and our circadian biology Hmm. knows that it's winter? Is it our microbiome is changing due to the daylight? Uh, there, there must be something going on. And I know some people that are very left-minded, kind of you know, logical and analytical are thinking like, this guy has now gone off the deep end. I'm clicking off. But just hold on. I've noticed even with my chickens, you know, for example, just using birds because they don't have, you know, they can't volitionally, they, they don't know that it's January and January, right? They just know the days are shorter. So they're going in, they're fasting for longer periods of time. They're eating less and they're spending more time, you know, in the chicken coop, right? So I've noticed that animals respond a lot to light and dark cues. Whereas humans, we kind of do the same stuff. We go to bed at the same time in the winter and the summer, you know, because we have lights, we have Wi-Fi, we have artificial ways of like uh, circumventing nature's uh, rhythms. And so I think there must be some element that we don't yet know about of circadian biology that then influences our own biology and causes our our metabolism to, to shift in a little bit. So I do encourage people, you know, again, as much as we both share the mutual love for polyphenolic compounds for how they do affect things like autophagy signaling and nutrient sensing enzymes, AMPK, PGC1 alpha, I do suggest like taking it easy on them when they're not in season in the winter, like as we film this right now. Well, yeah, I do know like the, how important the circadian clocks are, but I didn't know that, you know, actually eating fruit out of season can make some mice gain weight, <laughs> which is quite interesting and really bizarre. It? Yeah, it's quite crazy. Uh, maybe it has to do with, you know, the, the organs themselves have like different circadian clocks and uh, they all kind of f- function based upon the cues you get from the environment. So it's, it may it make it sense because fruit itself kind of contains a little bit of light and electrons inside it that comes from the sun. So that can that maybe play a bit of part, which we really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Let's so you, you bring up something that's super fascinating that I've been diving deep in. 
And thanks to, you know, people critiquing me online, talking about like grass fed meat, there's no real difference. And um, I, I've wanted to like dive deeper into this. And, you know, yeah, we can talk about omega-3 fatty acid profiles in the meats and the differences between grain fed and grass fed meat. But I'm kind of interested, like what you're speaking about is the different potentially like epigenetic signals mm -hmm. that we can't really measure or see or talk about. Right. And so certain studies have shown that we actually absorb and our gut microbiome absorbs the micro RNA from the food that we eat. And so if we think about our cells in our body, we often hear about our nucleus, we hear about DNA, we hear about genes, but kind of the in-between. So basically, I know you know this, Sim, but for everyone else listening that doesn't have a degree in biology, basically what genes do is they make proteins. That's all genes do. And those proteins can be enzymes. Those proteins can be building blocks for other molecules and so forth. And the in-between, the, the DNA, the gene, and the protein is RNA. So that's kind of the message. So your gene, basically, your genes make a copy of themselves, and that's translated into the, the language of protein. And so that mRNA, that intermediate between the protein and the DNA, we absorb that from the food that we eat, and it's not yet totally sussed out. Is the RNA from the food that we eat, is it affecting our microbiome? And then that's affecting our biology. Or is the epigenetic signals or, and or the RNA that we, is that, are we internalizing that? And is that affecting mm. our own gene expression? So I think you hit on something, Sim, and that's that potentially we're absorbing molecules that are independent of their macronutrient composition, right. carbs, fats, proteins, and even DNA. We're getting this epigenetic signal somehow uh, from our food. And so I think that really speaks to food quality. Because, you know, it's, that's why I am a stickler when it comes to grass fed versus pasture rays and all that. Because we know, for example, we just spoke about circadian clocks and light exposure. When people go and just buy conventional, at least in the US, it's probably better in Europe, you know, where you are or other parts of the world. But when you go buy a traditional conventional chicken, for example, these chickens are living on concrete in basically a bunker. They never see daylight. So their circadian clocks are all screwed up. They're eating you know, genetically modified junk food, water that's enriched in plastic and probably fluoride and chlorine and all that. They're con in a confined environment. What I'm trying to say is, you know, the, the genetic switches that are turned on are probably not favorable, right? And so when we eat what we think is protein, because we're looking at, a lot of people are focused on, on their macros, proteins, carbs, fats. But what about the epigenetic signals that, that, that comes with that protein? And so there is studies, at least that showing that when we eat plants, and so it's not yet sussed out for animals, but when we eat, for example, like lettuce or plants, we do absorb that micro RNA, that, that mm. epigenetic switch. So I think it's, it's interesting. It, it shares with us and it provides this element of food quality that sometimes is lost in the narrative of any diet, right? Where yeah. we just focus on the macros and the calories and everything. That's important. Absolutely. Right. But, um, what ultimately affects our metabolism is the genes that are turned on or turned off, our epigenetics. Mm -hmm. And if we are absorbing these epigenetic compounds, i.e. the mRNA, the transfer RNA, the exosomes, the, these things that are measurable, like we can, we can measure these. And either we absorb them or our microbiome absorbs them and something happens. I think that's really interesting, something that we should think a little bit more about. Because, for example, uh, th this whole notion of pre-slaughter stress and people mm -hmm. are like, Hmm, what's that? There's literally, if people want to nerd out, you can go to, it's a journal inside El Savior called Meat Science. So if you just type in Meat Science Journal, it's a journal all about meat scientists, where, where meat scientists are looking at the composition of meat, how they give, for example, uh, one study actually showed where they gave pigs, swine, they gave them omega-3 fats. It led to like changes in the composition of the meat. But what they look at is pre-slaughter stress. And this is a major problem for animals because it affects the acidity of the meat. So if an animal is very stressed out going into the slaughter, it can affect the comps and it can literally damage the meat so much that they have to throw it out. So there can be a big loss. So the business side of agriculture is looking at ways to make not only just to appease to maybe vegans and the anti-meat and the peta crowd, but to make their meat quality taste better for their consumers by not having so much pre-slaughter stress. So animals you know, are shipped all around in trucks and then they're fed into where they get gassed or killed. And if they're very stressed, again, it affects the meat quality. So 
I think you know that that's an interesting aspect to kind of look at, and it shows that the meat, what they found is that there's different cha- the gene expression is different in the animals that are very stressed versus animals that are more humanely processed. So I think that's just another thing to think about. You know, um, if we eat an animal that is very stressed out, that lived a very stressful life, its death is very stressful. Um, I mean, gosh, what about the cortisol? What about the adrenaline? What about this, the epigenetics? Which is, mm-hmm. are we absorbing that? And, and just a, a, as a small sidestep, if you look at communities where they eat a lot of fast food, obviously the, the animals from like McDonald's and stuff like that, the chickens that, that go into making fast food, they're probably very stressed. We see more violence in those mm-hmm. communities. Is it a nature nurture thing? Is it a food thing? We know the food quality is very poor, but I have this subtle theory. And if you look at inmates in prison, there's a lot of violence there too. But if they change the food quality, violence goes down. So wow. is it just the macronutrients or the micronutrients? Or is it these epigenetic signals that, we're, that we've kind of glossed over and overlooked? Because up to very recently, we didn't have you know, good methodology to measure these things. So I think wow. it's a conversation that in the next 20 years, 30 years, we'll be like, oh, duh, that makes sense. But right now, it's, it's not on people's radar, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, man, you, I think you just uh, blew so many people's minds. And thanks for sharing this information because uh, sure. most people aren't even aware of these things. And yeah, definitely. Like, I do think that there will, these, that will be like a, quite a significant difference between uh, those uh, types of foods that you consume and on the epigenetic level as well. And definitely like food quality is something that uh, really matters, especially if you want to optimize your health and the nutrition to the fullest. So yeah, this, I didn't expect that you would, you know, go that deep into it, <laughs> which is quite cool. And sure, yeah, but. it's like grass fed got taken to another level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think there's more to it, you know, bec- and, and I say this because animals have personalities and uh, you know, I, I'm not saying that I grew up on a farm or anything like that, but we've had chickens now for three years and, mm. and, uh, I, I noticed that they're sensitive to stress and they pick up on it. Like when we processed our Turkey, so we, we got both all three turkeys in September. I've picked them up, put them into the chicken coop because turkeys like to sleep up high. Um, and so I've picked them up a hundred times, mm-hmm. maybe more over the last six months. But when I picked this turkey up to go kill him, he knew that it was coming and his foot and it makes me almost tear up just thinking about it because his foot was sh- his foot has never shaked in fact on thanksgiving we did a video and i held him for 30 minutes while we filmed the video and got it ready he didn't shake at all mm-hmm. but he could pick up on my stress cue because i was nervous i was like damn i gotta kill this guy I gotta slit his throat like i was like how is this gonna go Is the blood gonna get everywhere i'm like i was just nervous i want it to go very quickly right um but he was shaking like crazy. And it was like, how in the hell did he know? But I, I, I didn't pick him up any more aggressive than I did normally. And like I said, I've picked him up a hundred different times. And I have on video, his, I was holding him and my wife was recording his foot. He looked like a jackrabbit, his foot. And he's never done that in a hundred times or more than I picked him up over the last six months. So animals pick up on this, right? And so like the, the mediators and the molecules and the hormones that are causing that stress response they're real. Like they're, they're probably measurable. And then we killed them and we eat them. And so I, I just think um, people got to think about that. It's, it's not like you got to change your, diet, your diet drastically, but just have that on the back of your mind when you're purchasing your food and think about food right. quality. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like uh, quite a difficult situation for anyone who has like animals and so on. But uh, how, do, how are you going to explain it in a sense uh, that uh, you have to kill these animals in order to uh, you know feed your family yeah so i've thought about this a bunch of different ways um and and i so i had my daughter watch because i want her to be sometimes she'll say ew you know dad that that meat tastes gross i don't want it let's throw it out and i'm like an animal died for this. Like, you no, know, you were eating that or we're saving it in the fridge. So I want her to make that connection that like uh, cows and lamb and beef and chicken, it doesn't just like come out of the chicken tree, right? Like an animal had to die to get that onto your plate. So I'm trying to ink that into her head so she doesn't waste. Um, but this is how I look at it, Sim. Um, I care about these animals. I give them the best life possible. Filtered water. I collect rainwater from our roof so that they don't get like the pesticides and you know, there was an article in the, the Seattle Times where they tested the water. Uh, it was crazy. So there was cocaine, methamphetamines, antidepressants, <laughs> antibiotics. Like, 
uh, every drug possible is in the Seattle municipal water supply, which we drink, unfortunately. So I set up these, which is, it's crazy. This is illegal what I'm telling people. So don't uh, report me, but um, it's Ill- illegal to collect rainwater in the state of Washington, wow. which is insane. Like anyway, so I have rain bottles, uh, these 55 gallon drums to collect water. I feed that to our animals because I don't want them drinking the crap from the municipal water and so forth. And we have filtered water in our home, but, um, so here's the thing with, with humans, like uh, the, the vegans will say, well, you're killing an animal, you're depriving them of life and so forth. And I, I understand that, but animals don't go on to have great grandchildren and grandchildren. They don't develop careers. They don't go to college. It, is their life going to be any better if I let them live for 20 years, right? I, is the quality going to improve? And my, my thought is no. I mean, yeah, they might have fun, but for animals, every day is the same. They wake up, they eat, they drink, they poop, they fight, they play around, they go to bed they, and they repeat, right? It's like Groundhog Day every single day. So I've, I've thought to myself, if I were to let these turkeys or these chickens live forever and never eat them, how much more enjoyment will they get out of life? And some people might say, well, it's rude of you to judge how they would enjoy life. But it's, it's not like with humans, we, we do stuff, we travel, we have children, we, like our life quality should get better as we age, right? And it, with animals, it's, it just kind of stays the same. So that's how I rationalize it. And when I do kill them, because we have eaten chickens as well, um, I just make sure that it's very quick and they have a good life and that's it. And, and so people can judge me however they want. But look, if you were, uh, I think, and I kill them and they have a much more humane and enjoyable life than they would have if they were on another farm. And so that's, that's what I can control. So that's the way that I look at it. And the other part is the finances associated with it. So vegans will say, oh gosh, well, here you are killing these animals. It's like, okay, I'll let them live for 20 years. Are you going to pay for the food? They'd be like, well, I'm not paying for who's going to, then who's going to pay for the food? These animals eat a lot of food. It's not like their food grows on a chicken food tree. Like I have to go to the chicken store and buy non-GMO organic chicken food. That stuff's expensive. Like for all our animals, it's over a hundred bucks a month. So if I let these animals live for 20 years, what vegan or pet a group is, if, if someone wants to give me the money to pay for the food, I'll gladly not kill them and let them live and die of old age and, and so forth. But it costs money too. So that's the other aspect of it. Um, at least that's how I've looked at it. Mm. Maybe people are, are looking at it differently. Um, so that's how we view. Mm. Yeah, it's a diff- definitely a very complex uh, topic and uh, definitely not, not uh, that uh, we can delve too long on this podcast. So uh, maybe we'll uh, switch topics for a little bit. Sure. And uh, let's talk about uh, maybe like intermittent fasting. You've been quite into that as well recently. And it's been it's been pretty popular on social media as well. So what are your like thoughts and experiences with it? Yeah. So fasting, I mean, it can be wonderful. You know, I think uh, for people that are trying to improve blood sugar health, I think it's the best, one of the best things that you can do. Uh, but there's so many side benefits to fasting, which, which is different than just continuous energy restriction or calorie cutting. And so that's what I love about this. And, you know, so at first, like, you know, when fasting kind of became really popular in 2015, 2016, I was doubtful like everyone else. I thought, you know what, I need to preserve my muscle mass. I'm not going to do this. But several conversations with Dr. Jason Fung and other people, I realized and friends that were doing it and experiencing great results. I was like, okay, I'm going to try this. And uh, what I tried first was time restricted feeding. So that is just compressing your feeding window uh, due to kind of my background and research in the circadian biology world. And I I noticed some really good results with that. Then started doing more longer fasts, like a three-day fast, you know, over 50 hours every quarter. So I just have it on my calendar. It's just there. It's just what I do. Um, So I found that to be very effective. And what I've noticed personally, Sim, is just increased mental clarity. I mean, that's the the biggest thing for me. Um, Is it the neurotransmitters that are increased associated with fasting? There's one neurotransmitter that was recently shown, Orexin A increases. We know dopamine, norepinephrine, all these different neurotransmitters increase. Or is it the, do I have some glucose hypometabolism in my brain that was being ameliorated from the ketones being made when I was fasting? I'm not really sure what exactly mechanistically is associated with the mental clarity, but so many people and I'm sure you've noticed this as well, uh, report that. So that's one of the, the main reasons why I do it. Um, and I just found that like, I was doing like, you know, a three day fast here or there, a two day fast here. So what I've decided is just like to make it a little bit more consistent. Like some people have their cheat day on Saturday or whatever, mm-hmm. Friday, I don't know, mm-hmm. you know, consistently I found that like, so every Monday I fast. And so I just came up with this. I bought the domain Metabolic Monday like a year ago. And I was like, I sat on the idea. I was like, well, people even care about this. I don't know. And I just like threw it out there on social media. 
And people are excited because, you know, Sunday used to be meal prep. You know, you'd be mm-hmm. cooking chicken all day. You'd be putting in Tupperware containers. And then, you know, you have, and it's like such a waste of time. Like this is your day off to enjoy with your friends and family to get outside and you're meal prepping. I'm like, <laughs> what if you could just have this more flexible approach where you just like eat earlier, like eat at four o'clock and then fast all day Monday. You don't have to worry about that, like meal prepping for the week and doing all that. Or at least you can do that on a work night, you know, instead of like blow your whole Sunday meal prepping. Mm. And then plus you can kickstart the week in a better mood. So, you know, if you have a food coma or you're just eating and you're bogged down, low glucose, like, and like with anything, like in life, momentum begets more momentum, right? So mm-hmm. if you start your week like really in a funk and it's like you're lethargic and tired, your whole week can be screwed up. And so I just found that my work productivity was much improved. My energy, my productive output, my contribution to the world improved when I just fasted on Monday. So that's what I personally do. And then, like I said, I throw in that um, over 50 hour fast. I struggle at just me personally. Um, I struggle after 50 hours with sleeping. That's just, I don't know what it is. So I have a hard time with that. I commend people like yourself who have done five, seven day fasts. I think that's amazing. But I just personally can't sleep after about four, hour 48. I have a really hard time. Uh, hope Maybe that would change with time, but I just think it depends on body composition, your activity. So when I fast, I don't change my workouts. I try to do the same stuff that I normally would do. Um, so that's interesting. But that's what I personally find. And what I think is interesting for people to understand, especially the naysayers out there, is there is a metabolic difference. Uh, long-term studies have shown this. One, it was a research group at University of Colorado Medical Center uh, where they had two different arms of the study. One arm was a continuous energy restriction, so-called calorie cutting. For 12 weeks, another group was, inter- it was alternate day fasting, right? Mm-hmm. They looked at these individuals after the 12-week study and then three months later, And there was definitely a difference in body composition and also muscle mass. And the group that did the alternate day fasting had more lean muscle mass, lost more body fat, and didn't regain as much fat compared to the group that just did the continuous energy restriction. In fact, they gained more visceral fat and lost more muscle mass. So there... And this is where the calorie cutting, the Seco crowd, the Lane Nortons of the world, bless their hearts, but they they think that it's all the same. And I think... And here's the thing, Sam, and I, I want to pose this question to you, um, and it, it will sum up the studies that I was just referencing. I've done a lot of research into this. There, To my knowledge, and I could be wrong, I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think I am, there's no hormonal independent mechanisms that can sense nutrient signaling. And, and so what I mean by that is um, it, it's, an, it's virtually impossible to separate, to, to differentiate hormones from energy, right? Mm-hmm. So if we think about just burning fat for fuel. It's not that there's a dearth of energy. It's that glucagon is increasing. Insulin's low, right? There's a hormonal, right. they're synonymous. So, so the seco crowd, the calories in, calories out, will say, oh no, it's, it's not about hormones. It's all about nutrients. Mm-hmm. But check this out. And you know this, when you eat, let's just say we eat 100 grams of fat right now. Let's just say we have coconut oil, 100 grams of fat. Once the fat is digested, it's not like there's a molecular tag on the fat that we just ate that says, and the body says, oh yeah, well that fat is... In exogenous, and then we have endogenous fat here. Once you absorb these nutrients, there's no way to differentiate if they came from gluconeogenesis, lipolysis, if they came from our food, they're in the body. Mm-hmm. So I was like, the body, how does the body know if there's a deficit? It's hormones. Right. It has to be there, or, or, it's, or it's nutrient sensing receptors, AMPK, PG1 alpha, mm-hmm. mTOR, right? Mm-hmm. But even those ultimately are connected to their associated hormones, mTOR and insulin, PGC1 yeah. alpha, and so forth. So I was like, that, that to me was an aha. And again, tell me if you think I'm wrong on this. Oh, uh, well, no, no, I think uh, you're completely right that uh, uh, there is definitely like a matter of context that uh, the food that you eat, it uh, doesn't you know, get absorbed based upon just the macronutrients and so on. It gets, it gets, gets absorbed based upon the environment it gets put into, so to say, into the hormonal milieu in, in, that, that you can call it, so that whether or not you have higher leptin or you have higher insulin, like everything is going to change how that food or those calories get absorbed or uh, spurred off or stored. So yeah, definitely a lot of uh, hormones are in play. And uh, I do think that calories still matter, but you know, how those calories get expressed and uh, what, what matters or what happens to them, that's ultimately based upon the hormones and everything else that's going on in the like, particular individual. And even like the circadian rhythms and all of those things matter because you can eat the same food, like for instance, carbs, 
uh, you can uh, eat them post-workout and they're going to have like a completely different response if you had eaten them while sitting on a couch, so to say, because the, the, the carbs would be used for more muscle glycogen versus if you were sitting and being sedentary, then those carbs would be used for more, for like more easily for fat storage. So there's definitely a lot of context that has to be kept in mind. Mm, that's such a beautiful point. And so, yeah, we know, for example, in the post-workout window, the body is much, there's a lot of insulin independent mechanisms to absorb carbs, you know, so that's a beautiful example. So, mm. yeah, I, I mean, again, if anyone listening knows of a particular thing that I'm missing, and again, the, the question here is, I'm not saying calories don't matter like you, I full agree with calories in, calories out. It does matter to a certain point, but the main premise that I'm trying to, pro, you know, let, put out there in the universe is that there's really no hormone independent mechanism right. through which the body can partition nutrients. And so therefore, if you're in a calorie deficit and you're trying to get into a calorie deficit, what you're doing is you're ultimately affecting your hormones. And I, I emphasize hormones because a lot of the calories in, calories out groups say, oh, all the keto, they call them ketards, right? They call people like us ketarded, um, say, oh, they just focus on insulin. It's like, well, yeah, we, insulin is one of many different hormones, but it's just one hormone. We talk about glucagon, mm -hmm. we talk about leptin, ghrelin, adiponectin. We talk about a lot of hormones in, this, in the context of a ketogenic diet. And it's not just all about insulin, but that's just one of many different hormones. So I think it's interesting. And so I think ultimately what we're doing is we, yeah, we need to think about calories in context of hormones. And then the difference is, and the, this getting back to fasting, why I get excited about it, why I recommend people doing it, is it's a great way to resensitize the hormones involved in energy distribution and partitioning, particularly insulin, glucagon, and leptin, mm -hmm. uh, and also probably ghrelin, which is involved in appetite signaling. And so mm -hmm. one of the largest and longest ever studies done in humans, a controlled feeding study of this kind, uh, Carol Ebeling and David uh, Ludwig just posted this in um, November of 2018. They found that there was a hormonal differences uh, in individuals that ate high carb versus low carb and the ghrelin and leptin changes in addition to body composition and energy expenditure was different. And so a lot of people will say, mm -hmm. well, yeah, but these metabolic ward studies show something different. Well, okay, we have, tw we have yeah, 20 weeks versus 10 days in a metabolic ward. Right. Like we know that 10 days on a keto diet, like you're still not totally fat adapted, right? It can take six months. Some t people take a year, right? To really kind of, ch because we're talking about changing your mitochondria, we're changing cell membranes, we're changing, you know, um, monocarboxylate transporters and stuff like that. There's a lot of metabolic switches that need to be altered. So these controlled feeding studies in a metabolic ward for 10 days, I, I would put bet my money on a 20 week real long-term study just personally. Mm -hmm. So yeah. anyway, I think it's interesting. Yeah, that's for sure. And there's definitely like uh, an epigenetic change as well from both keto and uh, fasting. So I would imagine that in the past, humans would enter into ketosis only like during times of you know famine and starvation. So the kind of reasonable perspective or a reasonable option from the perspective of evolution would have been to down-regulate the hunger signaling and make the person or to make the people more able to bear caloric restriction and uh, not kind of cause that much damage versus on the other hand eating carbs that kind of signals the body that you know it's it's the environment where there's food is abundant and there's no need there's actually you have to do the opposite you have to eat as much as possible and it's kind of reflects in the in the way that those studies uh, kind of found as well yeah that's such a great point you know and and i think epigenetics gets lost in the narrative although you know we're hearing much more about that in lay press a lot of people don't really think about that and that's what you know because i know you asked kind of how you got into this and i was talking about chickens earlier um i you know when i first heard of keto in 20 that was 2003 there was a, a bodybuilder fitness model at the gym that i worked at who was keto and he had a lot of like breath acetone was really high he was eating a lot of protein too and i i just had this stigma associated with keto but then when it started to really kind of pick up in 2015 um you know, Jimmy Moore's book came out and a buddy of mine, Alessandro Ferretti was talking about it and how it changes heart rate variability. And I was like, this is kind of interesting. I'm going to learn more about it. But it was specifically the epigenetic effects that beta hydroxybutyrate, the main ketone made by our own liver, mm -hmm. how, how BHB affects gene signaling. Then I was like, oh my gosh, this is something, this is not a fad. This is something really powerful because glucose and, and these other protein yeah, they change network biology. They might ch change nutrient sensing enzymes, but because beta hydroxybutyrate is stro so structurally similar to another short chain fatty acid called butyric acid made by our microbiome, 
So high fiber foods, when we uh, stimulate the growth of bifidobacterium, for example, they make the short chain fatty acid that also functions very similarly uh, and potentially might you know, interconvert with beta hydroxybutyrate in the body. Um, that to me was really exciting because uh, I went to this um, American Association for Cancer Research AACR conference in 2008, and the whole conference was all about epigenetics and histone deacetylase inhibitors. And this was like the next wave in cancer therapeutics. They were focusing on garlic, uh, sulforaphane from broccoli seeds, or focusing on, on curcumin. And beta hydroxybutyrate and butyric acid were talked about a lot. And I was like, this is so cool. What, you know, what, I need to learn more about this. So I've been following that research forever. And then when I made the connection that when we're in ketosis, our body's making this histone deacetylase inhibitor that literally changes the way that our genes are expressed in a powerful way, I was like, oh my gosh, this is what these cancer researchers were talking about and so excited about. And they were spending millions or billions of dollars trying to develop drugs that do the same thing that ketones do. <laughs> right. And I was like, I'm like, wow, why not just have people fast or eat yeah. a ketogenic diet? Or if they're new to this, maybe take exogenous ketones initially to try and like get into it. But I, that's what got me so excited. And then since, since I made that connection in 2015, I haven't been the same sense, right? I've been diving into this and interviewing people and all that. So yeah, it is really interesting how uh, fasting, you know, uh, promotes this, and as well as like the keto diet itself. That how can you mimic similar responses by still being able to produce ketones while eating and so on? And how how can you yeah apply it to every other life? So it's definitely a lot, a lot to <laughs> a lot of re research to do in this field, and uh, some exciting times to come. Uh, oh, but absolutely. You, but you mentioned the metabolic Monday, so. Uh, how does it work or how, how, how do people uh, can do it? Yeah, so it's super simple. I mean, you know, I'm a pretty low-key guy. I don't have any rules and everything like that, but I just created this kind of arbitrary guidelines. Uh, look, 6 p.m. in your time zone, that's when you should cut off eating. Earlier, the better, but, but most people can do 6. And Because the thing about fasting and time-shifted feeding that can be challenging is it can get into your, your social networks mm. uh, and kind of make you feel like an outcast of sorts. We're, we're not trying to ostracize people and have them go to dinner parties and like stand around and not eat, right? So I think you can still you know, be social with your friends and family and cut off your feeding window by 6 and then 6 p.m. on Monday. So you're just basically, it's it's what if you have black coffee and maybe we can talk about this. I don't think black coffee is going to kick you out of ketosis or downregulate autophagy. If anything, it might enhance it personally, but I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Green tea, if you want to have tea. The thing is, you don't want to have a lot of other foods, right? So some Redmond real salts or Celtic sea salt of sorts, water, stay hydrated, but you don't need to piggyback. You don't need to have exogenous ketones. You don't need MCT oil. You know, all those things have their place, but we're really trying to get the body to dig into its own body fat stores and kind of kickstart uh, proteolysis and, you know, lysosomes and, uh, you know, autophagy and all that good stuff that you talk a lot about, uh, change your hormones. And if you really want, if you're, you know, if you have a lot of weight to lose, uh, we can have some people go in, into 6 a.m. at least or to make it 36 hours into Tuesday morning. Mm -hmm. But I just like to have people just be very consistent. So I, I did the math, you know, if you look at the calorie restriction studies and its association, um, with longevity and suppressing cancer, this has been known since like 1918, where if you restrict food from animals, they, uh, and even if you inject tumors, one study, this was like the first study ever on calorie restriction, so-called intermittent fasting, mm -hmm. where they had two different animals and they uh, calorie restricted one group and then the other group could eat ad lib. They injected tumors into both. The tumor expression in the group that was intermittent fasting was cut by like 70%. Wow. And so since that wow. time, right? And so this been known and reproduced in many different studies. And what they've actually shown is that um, it's around a 20% calorie restriction is linked with longevity and anti-cancer. And for a lot of people cutting their calories and figuring out what is it, 10% or 20%, how much should I, it's, that's challenging. And I think if we look at energy expenditure, it's more of a long-term or sorry, energy intake, it's more of a long-term play than just like every single day. So I thought, okay, what if you just fasted for like, and cut your calories like 15% over the entire year? Like, how could you do that? I was trying to think of like an easy way. Well, if you just fast one day a week, right? That's like 54, 52 days a year. That's roughly like 14%. So if you just are very consistent about that, you know, because some people say, oh, I did a seven day fast or I did a five day fast and they do it once a year because yeah. they get excited. And, you know, so I was like, if you were just consistent, you're kind of getting to that sweet spot of around 15 to 20% energy restriction for an entire year. 
So I was like, if people could just be very consistent with that one day a week, and it doesn't have to be on a Monday, but it kind of flows metabolic Monday. It sounds cool. So I just started, that was the premise of like just getting people to be consistent. And then if any other time restricted feeding or any other feeding window compression or any other long fast sprinkled in throughout the year, Mm -hmm. it's just icing on the cake. If you're just consistent with that one day a week where you're getting at least 24 hours. And so that's kind of the impetus and the premise. And so, yeah, rules are very basic. It's water, uh, salt. If you want to have black coffee, cool. If you want to have green tea, fine. Um, You just don't want to have a lot of creamer, a lot of stevia, a lot of sugar, you know, things like that, that as you know very well and have written about in your great book, um, you don't want to have those things because we want to get our body to start to burn up some of these aberrant proteins that are in our cells and different fatty acids and glucose. So, mm. yeah, that's that's so cool that yeah, uh, you you don't necessarily you know have to fast for seven days in a row if you do it only once a week or once a year, so to say. That you would be much better off by having these slightly longer than twenty four hour fasts more frequently because the frequency aspect is much more important, so to say, than doing it really intensely once and then eating like garbage the rest of the year. So that's definitely <laughs> yeah. like a much more sustainable way of going about it. And, you know, once one day of fasting isn't going to be that difficult for most people, at least, and they can still, you know, push through it to a certain extent. That's, that's really yeah, a good idea. And, and I would imagine that the society itself would also benefit a lot <laughs> if it went more viral and more popular because, you know, as you said earlier, that, a lot of people spend so much time on meal prep and everything. So uh, a lot of resources as well as time gets simply wasted on uh, creating food, whereas in reality, you would benefit your health and uh, longevity by simply fasting and not eating. You bring up such a great point, Sim. And and so we all have friends or people in our family, uh, people in our, our networks that like, they do a big athletic event one time a year. They're like, I'm going to do a marathon, right? So they like train for a little bit. They do this one big event and then they don't do anything for the rest of the year. And then we, we know other people that every single day or, or three days a week, they go to the gym. They're very consistent, right? Mm-hmm. And if you look at their body composition, you know, it's the people that have the most consistency usually that have the, the, you know, the most vibrancy and health and, and so forth. Same with people in their business, right? If they're very consistent in their business, their business grows, right? Or other people, they do a big launch and then you don't, don't hear from them for a year. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking with fasting, it's got to be the same way, right? Um, so I was like, it just makes sense that you just be a little bit more consistent. And I think it's impractical, sorry, it's, it's not practical for people to fast every single day. So I was like, just pick one day where you're really the busiest. For a lot of people, it's Monday because you're like back to work, you got kids, you got all this stuff. And I'm like, how nice is it to free up all that time? Because I mean, we all love food. We're, as Rob Wolf has said, you know, we're wired to eat, right? So if you can just take that bandwidth away and just focus on what you need to do. And for some people, that could be reading books, that could be learning a foreign language, that could be learning an, to play a new instrument, that could be exercise. Like there's so much like time that is freed up when you're not worried about food. And you and I both know, Sim, what do people complain about? They don't have time. I don't have time to eat healthy. I don't have time to go to the gym. I don't have time to learn a new language. I don't have time to do all this. Well, it's like, all right, you, I just freed up like an extra three to four hours every week by, by yeah. not having to worry about food, man. So yeah. I think it's a fun thing to do. Yeah, and especially if you, uh, you know, sum it up throughout the entire year, then you're going to get like an additional month where you can do other stuff <laughs> besides eating and uh, imagine all of the uh, fat burning benefits as well and caloric restriction benefits. So it's really cool. Yeah, buddy. Thanks, man. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, But, you know, the same principle applies to like exercise as well and physical movement that uh, you do have to kind of not only, you know, you you should exercise in in an intense way in some shape or form, but also it's uh, important to kind of incorporate some physical movement throughout your entire day as well. And, uh, you know, do some gardening and uh, grow your chicken and everything else. So that would be like another way of making healthy lifestyle easier and um, almost like putting it on autopilot. You bring up a great point, and that's a beautiful side benefit. Uh, I, I know there's a lot of people out there that are like, I'm zero carb, I meat, I eat meat only. It's totally cool, man. I, I totally get it. But one of the side benefits of like growing vegetables, growing berries, having chickens, like you just said, is it forces you to get out. So, so it's like there's many benefits. You get better food. Mm-hmm. You're in training your body's circadian biology because you're out during the middle of the day getting light exposure to your retina. Because let's face it, people can be indoors now 24 hours. You, you don't even need to go out. You can order your groceries. You can you know, date online. You don't even need to go to a bar or coffee shop to meet a spouse, right? You can just order it on your phone on Tinder, Bumble or whatever, right? So I think it's nice to just get back to your roots and get outside a little bit. And even if you live in a condo or an apartment, you can put some plants, some rosemary, some 
you know, garlic, you could do onions, you can grow chives, you can grow a lot of things in boxes and in planter boxes. And uh, so having that, you're necessitating being outside and being in nature. And, and so there's, like you said, the side benefits of that continuous movement. Hmm. You know, a lot of people, they, they do their booty bar class or their workout, their, you know, and then that's it. They sit around all day like, I'm, I'm good. But we, we, you and I both know that it's that continuous energy, just fidgeting, just sitting here fidgeting increases thermogenesis and helps your body burn more fat for fuel. So yeah. excellent. Yeah, yeah. We we also grow uh, some of our own uh, vegetables and some of our herbs. And, uh, you know, I can I can skip the potatoes or the tubers. I can buy them from the store because I don't eat them that often. But I do like to grow like these uh, herbs like rosemary and thyme and parsley and those things because, yeah, they're really more, they're more uh, nutrient dense. And, you know, you get more of these micronutrients that you don't necessarily get from other other foods. And they're pretty, pretty damn amazing. Absolutely. And so I, and like you said, I mean, you know, there's a lot of anti-nutrients in different vegetables. And so I do see, you know, the impetus to go on a carnivorous zero carb diet for a lot of people, but I don't think there's a lot of like toxic nutrients in, like you just said, tarragon, thyme, right. parsley, oregano, rosemary. I mean, I just see that as just, it's just, it's all a bonus. It's all helpful. You know, we know that they help to diversify our microbiome. Diversity is linked with more stability. We know that even if you cook meat, for example, the data is mixed. I'm sure you've looked at this too. The the advanced glycation end products and different right. the rages, the receptor for advanced glycation end products in our body, and so there's some some speculation about you know how meat is cooked and all that sort of stuff. So I don't worry too much about that. I just if I'm going to cook burgers on a grill or whatever, I put rosemary in there, a little garlic, maybe a little turmeric, right, to potentially offset some of the advanced glycation advanced glycation end products that can be formed mm -hmm. through the cooking process. So I think even if you're a zero carb person you can benefit from these polyphenols. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, not, uh, like whole foods are definitely the way it's at. But uh, what, what, what about some supplements? Do you take any supplements as well? Yeah, so I, I go back and forth a lot on this. Um, I personally, I like melatonin. I think there's some good research out there. There was an animal model study that showed that if you continuously take melatonin, however, that it might affect the photoreceptors in the retina. So I don't like people to take too much. But there were some interesting studies, and I'm sure you've looked at this too, Sim, how melatonin may potenti potentiate autophagy. Mm -hmm. And so for people, like if I travel in different time zones, I'll, I'll leverage like one to three milligrams of melatonin when I get there. I do like that. I like myoinositol. This is a B vitamin. It's found in various different foods, but it's surprisingly powerful for how it affects blood sugar stability, blood sugar health, particularly in women with polycystic ovarian syndrome or more androgen-like phenotypes. They can benefit really well from myoinositol. You know, I take magnesium. I take taurine. Uh, I do like omega-3 fats in fish oil, and I try to be very science-based about recommending this for people um, and, and have people look at their omega-3 index. And this is now a test that's been actually funny. I used to sell this test to doctors back in 2009, uh, and doctors back then were like, what? Why do I need to look at this? And now more and more data is coming out, thanks to Bill Harris, and has looked at the correlation between a low omega-3 index and higher risk for sudden cardiac death. You know, the death where you have the marathon runner or the basketball player that ate organic and ate healthy and dropped out of a heart attack. So that would be like a sudden cardiac death. Mm -hmm. And what, what, we're, what scientists have kind of figured out is that cell membrane fluidity is, plays a big deal, plays a big role. And so if we have more long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids from EPA and DHA, the main uh, fatty acids you get from say krill oil, fish oil, or grass fed beef, for example, and wild caught fish, you can still get great omega-3s from them. Um, that affects our, the, the pliability, the malleability of our cell membranes. And I think uh, I, that's important. Studies have shown that's important. Uh, there was research in inmates actually where they gave them fish oil and showed that their aggression scores decreased and actually there was if you just one study of it was in europe actually they they looked at many different prisons i can't remember the total pool of data but it was it was a large subset and they found that over 75 percent of inmates have an omega-3 index lower than four percent which is very low mm -hmm. uh Actually, surprisingly, most people probably listening right now that are not familiar with this, they might have a low omega-3 index below four because most people do. That's like the average. But if you increase your omega-3 index to around 8% or even 10%, your risk of you know, uh, depressive behavior, your risk of uh, aggression, and even sudden cardiac death drops. So I, I know people are like, oh, fish oil, you don't need it, it's whatever. But it's like, well, maybe you don't, but you should probably spend 49 bucks 
you know, when you do your labs, test your omega-3 index and just figure out for yourself if you need fish oil or not. So I found with me, mine was around 6%. So I don't supplement too much. I just take like one or two very clean capsules per day. Mm-hmm. Um, I like berberine, berberine hydrochloride. I think, you know, if you look at where um, so-called autophagy memetics kind of mm-hmm. are, are trending, metformin, AMPK activators, berberine hydrochloride is really powerful. Um, you know, I know you write about it in your book, metabolic autophagy and so forth. So uh, that's one that I periodically take. When I had a continuous glucose monitor, I was really surprised at how effective berberine was at keeping that glucose very constant, very low. And as a response, the body helps to, you know, you make more ketones as a result. For mm. So for people chasing ketones, I think that can be helpful, but I don't take too many supplements. Those are kind of the handful that I draw from. Mm. What kind of a brand are you using with the berberine? Yeah, berberine. Well, so here's my bias and just, you know, keep that um, in context here. So I have my own brand and started my own company called Myoscience. So I've worked with manufacturers for the past 13 years as a consultant. So I've just partnered with people I really trust. Hmm. I've been to these facilities. I've seen the raw material procurement process. I see how they third party test, how they build and make things. Um, So I do offer my own berberine through Myoscience. But um, what you want to look for is berberine hydrochloride. So some people say, oh, I take berberine leaf or berberine root. That might be helpful, and I'm not picking on whole food at all, but I, I do like to draw on clinical studies, and all the studies are uh, if, for berberine specifically use standardized berberine hydrochloride as the form, mm-hmm. and so that is the particular form that has been shown to be most effective, at least in human clinical studies. So that's what I recommend. Dosages, you can start at 600 milligrams a day and work your way up. I will say if you want to be very evidence-based, the research does show that 1,500 milligrams per day is what's been shown to be effective for affecting triglycerides, for affecting blood sugar, for affecting waist circumference. There was one study that showed that it literally lowered you know, visceral fat within the waist. So I think it's effective, but you need to be kind of cautious initially because it is very powerful. Right, yeah. uh, and so, you know, if you're having blood sugar swings all the time and eating, you know, not being, you know, testing even your own glucose, uh, you can be potentially hypoglycemic when you first try this. So always, you know, work with a practitioner if you have one, exercise caution. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Like uh, berberine is like a really powerful thing. And uh, if you do take it, then you can notice like a drop in blood sugar, even like within minutes. And it's really something that you can definitely like add even on a keto diet, but especially like if you're eating carbs, then you can also have it like post post eating and you can drop your blood sugar faster. So it's really useful and it's like more natural than uh, metformin or, or something like that. Right. Yeah. But yeah, yeah it's been... Point. Yeah, it's been really great talking with you and you dropped a bunch of uh, knowledge bombs and I'm sure like people learn a bunch of uh, new information about it. But uh, where, before I ask my last question, uh, where can people learn more about you and uh, your work? Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, it was awesome chatting with you, man. I feel like not too many people, like we, we covered a range of topics and, um, you know, I know that you can, you can hang and you know, you're on similar you know, wavelengths. So I've learned a lot from you and I want to thank you for your work. Um, but yeah, my main website is high intensity health. Like you, um, I put up YouTube content pretty consistently. So that's like YouTube and Instagram. Like if anyone wants to connect and say, Hey, you know, I watch on Simlon, just send me a note. I, I'd like to you know, hear from you guys. Um, so yeah, highintensityhealth.com is the main site. Yeah. It's a great podcast and uh, you have some awesome guests there as well. Thanks buddy. Yeah. And uh, my last question is that uh, what's this one piece of advice or a habit you wish you adopted sooner that improved your body and your mind? Oh man, this is so good. There's so many, um, but you know, for, just for me, it's honoring my body's circadian rhythms. You know, there was a lot of days and nights where I would stay up late when I was writing my, my first book, belly fat effect. Like I would like have a bottle of wine, you know, just sip, sip on a glass, just to like stay up all night. And I thought I was like, yeah, I'm working hard. I'm hustling, man. I'm like, this is how you like make it to the next level. And you know, I would, my sleep was all over the place. And I remember like when I was 33, 34, I started to notice like I was getting gray hair and I'm like, man, I look like older than I really am. I used to look like everyone always thought I was way younger, like, oh, you must be 23, you know? And so I realized that I I was aging way faster because I was just like burning the candle at both ends. Like I used to, for this consulting gig, I would fly to Toronto, I'd fly to, you know, Chicago, I'd be all over the place living in airplanes. Some years I would fly 80 round trip flights around the country and, um, my circadian biology was so screwed up, man. Like I would just always tired and everything like that. And 
uh, I shouldn't have been. And, and, but, it, but it makes sense because I was screwing up my circadian biology. So if anyone's listening, um, the way that you mitigate that is just to really treat, like I know a lot of people treat their macros and their nutrition like to a T. Mm-hmm. But we need to, you know, treat light exposure and our, and honor our sleep wake cycles just like we do our, our macronutrients. I'm very passionate about helping people understand that because so many people are eating great, but they they have the phone in their bedroom. They're on the phone at night, all that bright light, and so um, just make sure that you're getting out. You're getting your retina exposed to morning light. So like before we got on this podcast, I walked my daughter to school. So it's good for her circadian rhythms because I was noticing that when we weren't walking her, when we would drive her at her other school, we used to drive. She would sleep in all the time. Now she's like up at the same time every day because we're exposing her retina right to that bright light in the morning. Even when it's cloudy, like the the penetration of that light is good to entrain your circadian clock system. So that was a long-winded way of saying like there's one thing I wish I would have known earlier uh, is being very consistent with my light exposure and my sleep and wake cycles because that plays a huge impact on so many different things, blood sugar, health, Mo- and mostly just energy and aging. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good answer. And uh, yeah, there's something that I think we all wish we know the sooner, like science in general, that the circadian biology is like actually so central to everything that happens, like uh, your health and uh, general like cognition even. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, great point. Yeah. So yeah, well, thanks for coming to the podcast and uh, looking forward to seeing you in the future sometime soon. Sounds good, Tim. Thanks so much for having me on. Congrats on the book launch. It's an amazing book. If you guys haven't checked it out yet, you definitely got to do. One thing I'll just say, uh, Sim, what I really learned about was the different ways to stimulate autophagy. And you talk about like, uh, like a low insulin uh, in relation to mTOR. So if you want to, like for those of us that want to put on muscle, but still get the benefits of fasting, like you introduce a lot of new concepts that I haven't heard anyone talk about. So I want to commend you for doing that. And so if folks haven't yet gotten the book, definitely check it out because it's a great book. All right, thanks, man. <laughs> thanks, buddy. All right, that's it for this episode of the Body Mind Empowerment Podcast. If you want to support us, then I would greatly appreciate it if you could leave us a review on iTunes and the other social media platforms. You can now order my new book, Metabolic Autophagy, that covers a lot of the same topics that we talked in here. It's a collection of certain lifestyle habits and practices that prioritize longevity as well as performance. To support this podcast, you can also become a Patreon and get exclusive video lectures from my biohacking bootcamp that covers circadian rhythms, intermittent fasting, autophagy, resistance training, biofeedback, and many more. But other than that, my name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.